Okay. Grandpa, will this be our Christmas tree? Someday. Come on, Katie. Let's go. Great job. I'm really proud of you guys. Look how big it's gotten. God, it's great. It's a beautiful tree. Is it ready yet? Someday. Come on. Let's go back to the house. Ready yet? Someday. Come on. You think it's ready? say hi to everyone here, and I want to say hi to everyone joining us online. Uh, and I'm saying hi to everyone joining us online this week because we decided to change the way we're uh, recording for those who watch or listen online. Uh, for the last several years, we've been pre-recording messages that we typically will uh, make available on Friday night. Uh, we've decided moving forward that we are going to record our live service on Sunday morning, and this teaching will be available on Sunday afternoon on our website and our YouTube channel. Uh, the study guide will be posted with those videos on Sunday afternoon, uh, but if you need it before then, we actually have a QR code in your bulletin. Um, you could uh, scan that and get the bulletin earlier if you want it. Or you could also get it from the weekly email update that we send out. Uh, something else that I would like to announce is we are adding a second service on January 21st. <clears throat> uh, you'll receive a survey tomorrow asking for input on service times as well as a link to uh, volunteer at one of those services. Uh, we're adding an additional service for two reasons. Number one, we want our volunteers who are serving in elementary or middle school or on our welcome team or cafe team uh, to attend church. Uh, a philosophy we adopted early on as a church is attend one, serve one. We'd like everyone to attend a service and serve at a service. Um, on Sunday morning. Uh, we're not going to ask our current volunteers to serve at both services. So we want them to attend church. So we need a whole group of volunteers, a whole new group of volunteers uh, to support an additional service. Now, when I think of this, I don't think that it's too difficult. Um, if you take my family, for example, currently my two middle school students are in our middle school service while my wife and high school uh, daughter are in here, um, and when we add a service, my middle school students will be at their service, but then for the second service, they'll be serving in elementary. And my wife and high school daughter will be in here for one of those services, uh, and then they will serve either in elementary or middle school or on our welcome team or somewhere else at the other service. Um, and I'll be serving in here for both services. <laughs> If we have enough people to fill all of our teams, uh, you should be able to serve on a bi-weekly rotation. Uh, so really all we're asking is that two times a month that you would be here for about two and a half hours on a Sunday. So attend one, serve one uh, every other week. All right, the second reason we're adding an additional service is our philosophy from the very beginning of this church has been to always make room for more people in our community to attend church. Uh, the Barna and Pew Research Groups say that we have more unchurched people in the Bay Area than any other city in the country. And that's exactly why we started this church in the very beginning. Uh, we were struck with the reality that every church in our area could be packed out. Um, every seat in every church in our area could be packed out, and we would still have 90% of the people in our community that could not go to church on Sunday morning, which must break the heart of God, because every person deserves to have a place 
where they can be eternally transformed by the message of the gospel. So we are adding a service to make room for more people to come to Blue Oaks where souls can be saved and marriages can be resurrected and relationships can be restored, bondages can be broken, bodies and minds can be healed and where freedom can be experienced. You see, deep in the DNA of Blue Oaks is a conviction that introducing spiritually unconnected people to a God who gave his son for them and leading them into Christ-centered living is the highest calling on planet Earth. And that is why we are adding a second service in January. So more people can be led into this kind of Christ-centered living that we want to live. And I hope we have your support. Uh, we're going to need a number of you to engage and start serving with our teams on Sunday morning. All right, let me say a quick prayer, and then we're going to get to the message. God, we're so thankful for this church that you've blessed us with, that we get to be a part of. Thank you that you use us to advance us fallen people, us sinful people. We don't get it all right, but you use us in spite of ourselves to advance your kingdom in this community. And I just pray that you would open us up to uh, be responsive to more people, help us to be responsible with what you've entrusted us with here. And uh, may we see more people come into a relationship with you and more people live uh, a Christ-centered life as a result. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me just say, uh, I'm so glad that you decided to be here at the start of this Christmas series. Um, you know, anytime we hear good news, uh, human beings are kind of wired to want to tell other people about it. Uh, when something good happens, when we're excited about something, uh, we're just wired to want to spread the word. Uh, and I'm sure we've all experienced this. Maybe when you got your first car, like you just could not wait to tell everyone about it. Maybe when you had your first child, um, you just couldn't wait to tell everyone. I remember when we had our first baby, Lily, uh, we just could not wait to tell everyone about her. Uh, sometimes it's something real small. It doesn't have to be a big thing. I remember the first time I went to San Francisco and I went to a place called Ghirardelli Square. And I had something called Ghirardelli milk chocolate caramel. Um, have you had those little milk chocolate caramel squares at Ghir Ghirardelli Square? Like, I, I don't know how you could eat one of those and not believe in God. <laughs> Like, it was the best thing that I have ever tasted. Like, I wanted to tell everyone about it. Like, this stuff is amazing. Sometimes it will be an experience that we've had, like a Broadway musical like Hamilton or a Taylor Swift concert experience, or even a YouTube video that you love. You get a message from someone say, you got to watch this. And I want to show you one that I saw recently just to illustrate how much we love to share these kinds of videos. Check this out. Attention passengers, this is your flight attendant speaking. It is getting closer to the holidays and our captain has a special tradition he likes to do where he leads us all in a holiday song. So if I can please get your attention. I'll be home for Christmas. You Everyone loves something like that, uh, which we do. We have such interesting language about it. Uh, what do we say happens to it? 
we say it goes viral. Like, it's like a virus, it's like infectious. It will, it will spread, but you can't stop it. We're just like that. When we get excited about something, we just want to talk about it. We want other people to know about it. We are uh, spread the good news uh, kinds of people. We're good news spreaders. Now, with that in mind, I want to show you a passage of scripture from the Christmas story. This is from the Gospel of Luke about uh, some shepherds. Luke says, when they had seen him, Jesus, they spread the word. Um, they had just been shepherds, but now they have a message. Now they have a mission. Um, now they're shepherds with a message that changes lives. They've become not just shepherds, but life changers. And today I have an important message for everyone who calls Blue Oaks home as we look forward to Christmas. Um, it has to do with spreading the word about Jesus, about being one of these kinds of life changers. And I want to talk about why it matters so much. And I want to talk about how God invites us to be a part of this. So here's the story. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea the, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. Now, I want to talk about a kind of contrast about the good news, because this is a real important understanding uh, of this story. Uh, the story begins, and Caesar Augustus makes a decree that all the world should be taxed. That was the purpose for the census, so that Caesar could tax everyone in the known world, which is a pretty awesome, awesome thing when you think about it. Like, one guy is able to make a decree, and everyone ought to pay money to him. Why? Caesar knew that he was the one who had all of the power. He was the one, he believed, who was the good news for the entire world. As a matter of fact, this is from an ancient inscription, Caesar Augustus is savior of the world. That language, savior of the world, is kind of loaded language because Caesar claimed that as his title. In fact, the word gospel, good news, in Greek it's the word evangelion, was actually a technical phrase that would be used in the first century to describe the beginning of the reign of a Caesar. The assumption was that that was the good news for the human race. The, the beginning of the reign of that Caesar was good news for the human race. This is a, another ancient inscription from the first century the birthday of the god Augustus, Caesar Augustus, he claimed to be divine, has marked the beginning of the good news, the gospel, that's loaded language for the world. It's kind of an odd thing. The birthday of Caesar was regarded as the beginning of the gospel, the good news. Does anyone here know when Caesar Augustus' birthday is? It's September 23rd. I looked it up. You've all missed it. Um, Hallmark does not sell birthday cards for Caesar Augustus. However, there is another birthday from that day that is still going real strong. Now, can you imagine how surprised Caesar would be? Caesar had all the money. Caesar had all of the clout. Caesar had all the power. He believed his reign was good news for the entire world. He was bringing peace to the world. He was bringing prosperity to the world. Any reader in the ancient world would have thought Caesar is the good news. Now Luke says the strangest thing happens. Caesar makes this decree that all the world ought to be taxed. And in another part of the world that he would never visit, in another country that he had probably never heard of, a man that he would never have met named Joseph goes to his hometown. By the way, his hometown happens to be the place where, according to ancient prophe prophecies, the Messiah, the Savior, the Savior of the world, uh, would be born. Immediately, for anyone reading this story, the question would be asked, who is really in charge? Like, who is making the decisions? Who is this really good news for? The story of Christmas is the story of Joseph going home. 
Uh, Christmas is all about going home. Uh, we don't know how much, uh, we don't know much about Joseph's home. We don't know if he had property back there or if he had been there recently. Uh, did he have family there? All we know is it was a little town called Bethlehem. It's really interesting. In Hebrew, Bethlehem means house of bread, the house of bread. One would be born there who would say one day, I am the bread of life. If you're hungry at the core of your soul, you need to come to me. Now, when I think about Christmas with my kids, I think about time with Uncle Mike and Aunt Linda and Kathy's mom at their home in Arizona. Uh, sometimes we were there for Thanksgiving, but we would also celebrate Christmas. Um, we have a lot of great memories in that home. And I can't help but think of bread. Um, is there anything in the world that smells better than fresh baked bread? Um, Aunt Linda loves to bake, and so she would bake banana bread, uh, just this fabulous bread with no walnuts, the way God intended banana bread to be made. <laughs> then she would make cookies all week long, like mostly just butter, lard, and sugar. Um, and she would make some of the best uh, chocolate fudge I have ever tasted. I would probably gain 10 pounds in a week. Um, Aunt Linda cares that people really enjoy Christmas. Not so, many, not so much how many Christmases they will be around for. <laughs> now, when I think about Christmas, when I was a little kid growing up, um, I think of our home on Fletcher Street in Chicago. Uh, we were there from the time when I was in third grade until I graduated from high school. Uh, and when we were real young, we would spend Christmas Eve with my dad's side of the family. Uh, my dad had two brothers and two sisters and a lot of cousins on his side of the family. We would spend Christmas Eve either at my uh, grandpa and grandma's house or my aunt and uncle's houses. And then on Christmas Day, we would spend time with my mom's side of the family. My mom had three brothers and two sisters, and there were a lot more cousins on my mom's side of the family. And there were a lot more uh, divorces and remarriages too, and so it was really hard to keep track of how we were all related. Um, but we would go to someone's home on Christmas, and I just remember it as a kid being a lot of fun. Um, and it's kind of an odd thing. Uh, in all of those homes, there was a lot of joy, and uh, I loved being there when I was growing up. But there was also a lot of pain in every one of those homes. And mostly it was pain that I didn't really know much about. Uh, home for Christmas is what we're calling this series. And that may fill you with uh, nostalgia or gratitude. Uh, it may fill you with pain. Your home may just be like a, a Looney Tunes factory, and it just fills you with pain to go back there. By the way, we'll talk about that next week. The, the title of the message next week is Home for Christmas, Help. Um, <laughs> it's a funny thing about home. Home can create more joy than anything else, but it also can be associated with more pain than anything else. Home is actually quite a hard word to define. It's not just where you live. Like you may be in a building with your body in that building, but you wouldn't call it home. Home is supposed to be a place where you belong. Home is supposed to be a place where you're safe. Home is supposed to be a place where love prevails. But we live in a world that isn't safe and where everyone feels excluded and where love does not prevail. It turns out that our longing for home, our homesickness, is something this world cannot satisfy. You and I were made for a deeper home. We were made for a better home. And Jesus talked about this. He said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then this amazing promise, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and he will come to them and make our home and we will come to them and make our home with them. You were meant to be, as incredible as it is, the place God calls home. God, fought, God wants for you to be home with him, and he wants to be home with you. And this invitation stands for the human race. Jesus put it like this one time. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And he would tell stories about human beings being invited to come home. He would talk about a prodigal son who made terrible choices. Maybe you have too. 
He wounded his father. He wastes his money. And then he wakes up in enormous pain and he says to himself, I have to go home. Like, I don't know if I'll be welcome there, but it will be way better than where I am now. And what he doesn't know is that his father is waiting for him with outstretched hands. And Jesus says, the heart of the father is the heart of God for you, whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever you've done, just come home. He wants you to come home. Now, the invitation for you and me, if we've made our home with God through Jesus Christ, is to tell other people. It's an invitation to spread the word. Jesus is the savior of the world, and anyone who wants to can be home with God. Now, I know what happens whenever we talk about this. People will feel like, yeah, but I don't really know how to do this. I haven't been trained to do this. I'm not articulate uh, about my faith. I'm not sure what to say about it. I'm not really uh, prepared to do that. That's why I wanted to talk today about the shepherds. The shepherds were the first ones to spread the word. In our day, that we'll, we'll talk about shepherds kind of like, uh, like in sentimental uh, terms. We'll talk about, about them like these gentle, humble guys who are really nice, and of course, everyone would want to be around. But that, that's not the reality. In Jesus' day, shepherds were not regarded this way at all. In Jesus' day, they were actually looked down on. In Jesus' day, in Israel, there were certain occupations that, because of the people in them, and because of went, what went on in those occupations, they were regarded by the rabbis as despised occupations. There were actually lists of these occupations that rabbis would talk about. If you were a mother, you did not want your kids to go into these occupations. Despised trades included gamblers with dice, money lenders, uh, because they would oppress the poor, uh, pigeon trainers, <laughs> which is kind of strange. Uh, pigeon racing was considered a form of gambling, and so pigeon training was not a good occupation. Sabbath violating farmers, uh, for obvious reasons. And then shepherds. Shepherds were looked down upon. It was just assumed that shepherds were dishonest. Shepherds would take their flocks to graze on other people's lands. Uh, they would eat other people's grass. It was just assumed that shepherds would sometimes steal sheep from the flock for their own benefit. Shepherds were considered dishonest. They were thieving and disreputable people. In our day, there, would be, there will be certain occupations that people kind of make jokes about. Well, in the ancient world, this is from a Jewish writing called uh, Midrash, there is not a more disreputable occupation than that of a shepherd. Shepherds were so looked down on that they were not even allowed to bear witness in a court of law. Literally, if you were accused of a crime and your only alibi was that you were playing poker with three other shepherds, like you were out of luck. Uh, there was nothing you could do. They were not allowed to bear witness in a court of law. Yet the fascinating thing is, it was shepherds that God chose to be the first ones to bear witness to the birth of his son. Why? Because if a shepherd could bear witness for Jesus, anyone could bear witness for Jesus. You could bear witness for Jesus. I could bear witness for Jesus. It's not about credibility. It's not about how you can articulate the message. It's about the person of Jesus. It's about spreading the word. We say this, I have to tell you, right? We say that, we use that, I have to tell you. Like, it's some, sometimes we use that about some of the goofiest things. We say it about videos of cute animals. Uh, we say it about, for me and my family, we say it about like people who fall down and hurt themselves. Um, we say it about chocolate, we say it about cars, we say it about news stories, we say it about TV shows. Why wouldn't we say it about what matters most? One night when these shepherds are in a field, an angel appeared and shepherds are overwhelmed with fear and they're overwhelmed with joy. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. That's the word. That's the gospel. See, it's not just good news for respectable people. And it's not about Caesar. 
It's not about money. It's not about power. It's not about human circumstances. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He is not Caesar. Caesar is great, but he is no Jesus. I was thinking this week about some of the names that we talk about in our day. Uh, Warren Buffett. Uh, Does Warren Buffett have power? Like unbelievable power, right? He's the sage of of Omaha. Like he just has to say something and it can change markets. But he's not Jesus. He can't save anyone. Here's another name, Steph Curry. Does Steph Curry have power? Maybe not nowadays, but if you watch... They started out really well. Uh, If you watch the game of basketball, like you know there is not a player in our lifetime who has changed the way the game is played more than Steph Curry. I mean, he can get on a three-point shooting streak and change the outcome of a game in minutes. It's incredible. Steph Curry has amazing power. Jesus wishes he could shoot threes like Steph Curry. (laughs) But Steph Curry has never saved anyone. Steph Curry isn't Jesus. He'd be the first to tell you that. There's another amazing name, Taylor Swift. Does Taylor Swift have power? Like unbelievable power. If you date Taylor Swift and break up with her, she will write a song and the whole world will think you are a piece of scum. (laughs) Pray for Travis Kelsey. (laughs) Taylor Swift has unbelievable power, but she's not Jesus. She can't save anyone. Because there is only one name under heaven or on earth by which we must be saved. I'll tell you what the power of Jesus can do. Jesus, the power of Jesus can answer your prayers. Only Jesus died on a cross for you. Only Jesus can forgive your sin. Only Jesus has resurrected from the grave. Only Jesus can give you a purpose for your life. Only Jesus can give you hope beyond the grave. Only Jesus can make his home in your heart. Only Jesus was born in a manger and died on a cross and resurrected. And today, 2,000 years later, on the other side of the world, is still changing lives. Only Jesus does that. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Notice this. These are shepherds. Again, uh, there are a lot of reasons why the shepherds should not do this. Like, you're not even educated. Yeah, but Jesus. Like, you can't even testify in a court of law. Yeah, but Jesus. Like, there's no reason why we should listen to a bunch of uh, dirty, thieving, yeah, but Jesus. When they spread the word, all who heard it were amazed. And so now, it's our day. Now it's about you and me. And I want to ask you, because this is part of our mission as a church, will you spread the word? Like, will you be one of these life changers? This Christmas Eve, if there's any time of the year where people are going to open up their life to God, it's going to be this time of the year. And I just had this gnawing conviction. I don't want Christmas Eve to be like a a, a warm, fuzzy, religious experience for people. I'm praying around this. I'm working around crafting the most compelling and really challenging message. This year, Christmas Eve is going to be a great service in our new church home, and I'm going to teach the clearest message I can to tell people that Jesus invites them to give their lives to him. And I want to give you a challenge on this. Um, There's a thought that I usually discourage. A lot of times people will come to a service and Uh, they'll find themselves thinking, man, there's someone else I know. I wish they were here to hear this message. 
Now, usually that's a sinful thought. Let me tell you why. Usually, if I'm talking about stubbornness and you're having that thought, like you're the stubborn person who needs to hear that message. Like if I'm talking about lust, you are the lusty one who needs to hear that message or whatever it is. This year for Christmas Eve, I don't want anyone here thinking, oh man, I wish so-and-so was here to hear this message. And we want to do the very best that we can to create a service and an experience and a message that is inviting people. You have to know this Jesus. You have to give your life to him. And then the invitation for all of us is to be spread the word kind of people, to be life changers. In the time that we have left, I want to say a word about who, and I want to say a word about why. The who is there are about 8 million people in the Bay Area, and every one of them matters to God. The San Francisco Bay Area is one of the least churched uh, metropolitan areas in the country. And I know that can be very abstract, and we can think and say, yeah, I've heard it all before. Until one of those people is your son, or your daughter, or your mother, or your father, or your brother, or your sister, and they don't know Jesus. All of a sudden, it's, just, it's not just a statistic anymore. For anyone who's ever been there, you know the pain that comes on Christmas Eve when your family is gathered together, and there's an empty place where someone doesn't know him. And you would give just about anything if there was just some church that was praying like crazy, someone who was praying like crazy to reach that person with the love of Jesus. Well, here's the thing, Blue Oaks, everyone is someone's son or daughter or mother or father or brother or sister. And we're going to be that church. Like, I'm going to be that person. I want you to be that person. There are 8 million people walking around the Bay Area. Most of them have no community of faith and they don't know God. And I want to say today, as clearly as I know how to say it, there is a who. There is someone in your life that God wants to reach through you. There is a who. And there is a why. The why is every human being is made for eternity. Like we all face the prospect of heaven or hell. And I know those words can be talked about in churches sometimes in ways that can be manipulative. I know that, but the fact still remains. The writers of scripture say God has placed eternity in the heart of every man and every woman. Death is not the end. And every human being is going to face death and eternity. An eternity of joy together with God or an eternity of unbelievable pain being excluded from the presence of God. No one in no church is so educated that they are not gripped by that reality. And here's the thing. Jesus is in the life-changing, life-saving business. And he does this all the time. And I want you to hear about one of those times. Uh, this is Marianne Whitman. Invite your friends to church and you'll win a candy bar. Let's fill up those pews on Christmas Eve with our unsaved friends. Those were phrases I heard while growing up in the church and even into my adulthood. And invite people I did. After all, who would pass up a chance to win a free candy bar? But tossing out invitations to church didn't produce many results. Very few people I invited actually came. And I thought I was a big failure and eventually got discouraged. I rarely asked anyone to come to church with me. And then I met Jenny. She came to work at the senior living facility where my dad was living. I was instantly drawn to her and we began developing a friendship. One day, I had the opportunity to share my testimony with her. Jenny politely listened and even seemed interested. I didn't think too much about it and I certainly didn't think to invite her to church. But a few weeks later, I ran into Jenny again and she told me that a Christian co-worker had been giving her books to read about the Bible. Jenny said she was filling up a notebook with questions she had about what she was reading. She asked if I knew of a Bible study she could attend to get some answers. 
I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I told Jenny I thought a Bible study wasn't the right venue for her because those are usually for Christians. I briefly thought about inviting her to church, but my fears kept me from doing so. Would she come to church and think it was a joke? Would she come and be turned off and toss her book of questions out the window? Instead, I offered to meet with her personally and discuss her questions. And then as I left her that day, I felt a heaviness in my heart. Maybe I should have invited her to church. I pleaded with the Lord to show me what I should do. That Sunday, Pastor Matt announced he was going to start a series based on the questions people have about the Bible. I almost fell out of my chair I was sitting in. Had I heard him correctly? A series that would answer questions? At that moment, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, there's the answer to your prayer. Ask Jenny to come to church with you. Well, not only did Jenny give an excited yes when I invited her, but she was waiting in anticipation at the curb when I arrived to pick her up that next Sunday. <laughs> now, ironically, Matt didn't start his series on the day he planned. Instead, the sermon he preached on Jenny's first Sunday was exactly what Jenny needed to hear. Now, I, I don't want to tell her story because that's hers to share. But I will tell you that Jenny put her faith and trust in Jesus Christ as her Savior and got baptized this past Sunday. Well, not only has Jenny's life been changed, but I've been changed by the experience too. Now, I already know that I'm going to be rejected by people when I invite them to church. And the people who do come may not make a decision for Christ. However, I simply need to make the invitation, then allow the Holy Spirit to do the work. As Matt said last week, Jesus leaves the 99 to go find one because that one matters to him. If only one person I invite to church comes and decides to follow Christ, it's worth the 99 rejections I might receive. And if you ask Jenny if she was worth the invitation, I guarantee you she'll tell you she was. So I just want to ask you, aren't you glad to be a part of a church where people are finding Jesus? Like, wouldn't you want to be a part of that for the rest of your life? Here's the thing. Like, I don't know what your job is. Uh, you may be retired. You may be volunteering someplace. You may be why, high, way high up on the ladder. You may be uh, low on the ladder, a shepherd, CEO. It doesn't matter. You're called to be a life changer. It doesn't matter who it is. I mean, the Bay Area or somewhere else. Like, no one is so rich. No one is so educated. No one is so beautiful. No one is so healthy. No one is so successful. No one has uh, climbed the ladder so high that they don't need to kneel before the cross. Jesus is still changing lives, and we get to be a part of it. And so my question is, will you be a life changer? Will you pray and ask God, God, will you help me to be really bold? Will you bring the names of those people to my mind? If my heart has been cold or hard about this, will you make my heart warm and tender toward people? Will you help me when I'm with people to think about how I can plant a seed with this person? Help me to think about how I can take a risk with this person, how I can be a little bolder about my faith with this person. Spread the word. Tell the good news. That's why we're here. All right, let me pray for you. God, I want to ask for everyone here who is a follower of you, would you help us Help us to remember again. Would you help us to be undone and overwhelmed again with this matchless person of Jesus Christ and this life-changing offer of his gospel that leads from death to life? God, we pray right now for those in our lives, uh, for some of us, God, that name or that face that comes to our, uh, our minds real fast, 
that son or that daughter, that brother or sister, that person at work, that person at a restaurant or a store that we love. God, would you be at work in them? Would you be at work all over this world, God, especially this time of the year in this Christmas season? Would you uh, bless every church and bless every ministry? And God, we pray right now for our church, for every follower of Jesus. God, uh, could what happened once through the shepherds happen again through every one of us? Would you just like fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can be uh, a light and a witness to those in our community? Help us to spread the word this season to so many, to people who don't know you, to people who need to understand that you are their savior and they can make their home with you. God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.